Hi has brought a lot of people out this morning. We uh, appreciate your presence, to our presence this morning as we uh, worship our God and Father in heaven. If you have a bulletin, please take a look. Our order of worship is a little bit different this morning. Let's begin with a song of praise. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Therefore I will hope in Him. Hey, good morning, everyone. I want to welcome each and every one of you this morning. And uh, it's wonderful to have you here with us in person on our website, YouTube, Facebook, or listening to our radio station. And just going to encourage all of you to please refer to your bulletin for important prayer requests and announcements, such as things going on today, like the McMaster sending, our Teen Devo, and Tennyson Lewis's house warming. Uh, so we also want to just ask you to be praying for Rachel Clannon. Rachel was admitted to uh, Benefis uh, yesterday and is in overnight. So just keep praying for uh, complete recovery and, and good solutions for Rachel Clannon. As has already been mentioned, today we'll be doing our assembly slightly different. We'll be discussing some of our future opportunities, and uh, the service information is in the bulletin. And there'll be no Bible class today from the teen class on up, as always. And as always, and as a reminder, we're anchored in Jesus as our Lord and God's Word. And the way we do biblical essentials will not be changing. So we'll now have our opening prayer. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we are thankful for this day and the sun, sunshine and the rain and a little bit of snow that we had. Father, we thank you that you replenished the land. We pray, Lord, that we can always remember that you are watching over us. Father, we pray for those that are sick. And we pray that you heal them. We say a special prayer for Rachel that they can find out what's, what's going on and she'll be able to go home soon. Father, we just want to pray for today's activities. We pray that you guide the, the minds of those involved. Lord, we do want to thank you for your son Jesus and we need to look to him always for our guidance in our lives and our spirituality. Father, we just, again, thank you for everyone here and we just pray that you can meet those individual needs. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Let's be standing for this song, please. Soldiers of Christ, arise and put your armor on. Strong is the strength which God supplies. Strong in the strength that God supplies through his beloved Son. Strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trusts, who in the strength of Jesus trusts is more than conqueror. 
Stand then in his great might, with all his strength endued. But take to what you for the fight. But take to what you for the fight, the panoply of God. Leave no unguarded place. Of the soul, take every virtue, every grace, take every virtue, every grace, and fortify the whole. That having all things done and all your conflicts past. You may or come to Christ alone. You may or come through Christ alone and stand entire at last. Please be seated. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is um, from 2 Chronicles, chapters 20, verses 3 and 4. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all of Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. There is beyond the azure blue a God from fear from human sight. He tinted skies with heavenly hue and framed the world with his great might. There is a God, he is alive. In him we live and we survive. Time ago, a God whose voice the prophets heard. He is the God that we should know, who speaks from his inspired word. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live and we survive. from mortal mind. God holds the germ within his hand. That men may search they cannot find. For God alone doth understand. There is a God. He is alive. In him we live and we survive. upon a tree, a life was willing there to give, that he from sin might set men free, and evermore with him could live. There is a God, he is alive, in him we live, and we survive. Hey, good 
Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Great to have each and every one of you here this morning. And uh, certainly it is great to know that our God is alive. Amen? Amen. And certainly we, we understand this. We look around us today that our God is an awesome God and the beauty of our creation that we can uh, enjoy so much. And a number of years ago, uh, a guy by the name of J.B. Phillips wrote a book and he said that the title of that book was Your God is Too Small. And so that, that book came out and for many people that, that view of God, their view of God is too small. And we understand that from God's word, our God is a big God. Amen to that? God is a big God. And we're going to be looking at 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And we'll go ahead and read the first couple of verses there. So let's read uh, verses 1 through 4 together. And just notice the situation that God's people are in in this context. After this, the Moabites and Ammonites, with some of the Munites, came to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told Jehoshaphat, a vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already at Hazazon Tamar, that is in Gedi. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. People of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. In this particular situation, we, we see that there's a, a war against a vast army, and we know that uh, certainly we're all involved in a war as well, aren't we? A spiritual war, the war against Satan. And certainly we know that we have the victory in that war, but this is something that we have in common. Jehoshaphat also resolves to inquire of the Lord, which has become a habit in his life. We see that in chapter 18, verse 4, and chapter 19, verse 3, that that has become his practice, his habit. And when you want to, uh, when you have to go through difficult circumstances, you want to have that kind of a habit in your life. You want to be known, you might want to know God, you want to be familiar with inquiring of Him and uh, seeking His will when you go through difficult circumstances. We also see that Jehoshaphat declares a fast, which is a great thing to do. Prayer and fasting God can use in a very uh, a meaningful way to accomplish great things. We also notice that all of God's people came together. We see their unity. They came together to seek help from the Lord. What a great blessing that is. And certainly we, we see that unity is, is essential in this particular situation. And we know it's uni it, unity is essential in our situation as well. So we go to uh, Jeho Jehoshaphat's prayer in verses 5 through 13. Let's read that together. And Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem at the temple of the Lord in the front of the new courtyard and said, Lord, the God of our ancestors, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of the nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can withstand you. Our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants of this land before your people Israel and give it forever to the descendants of Abraham, your friend? They lived in it, and they have built in it a sanctuary for your name, saying, if calamity comes upon us, whether the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence. Pay attention to that word stand. We'll see that a couple more times in this context. They're standing in the presence of God before the temple that bears your name and will cry out to you in your distress and you will hear us and save us. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when the, they came from Egypt, so they turned away from them and did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession you gave us as an inheritance. Our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are on you. That's the title of our message today. And all the, the men of Judah and their wives and children and little ones stood there before the Lord. So as we, we look at this prayer, we notice several different things. What is their focus? Certainly, 
we can see that their focus is on the big God that they serve. Their focus is not on the things that, that are around them, their circumstances, but they're focused on God in heaven, God who rules, God who has power and might. Their focus is not on himself or themselves or the problem, but their focus is on God. And the interesting thing about focus is whatever you focus on is kind of like having binoculars. It makes them seem bigger than they are. You know, whether you focus on your problems, most often when I focus on my problems, they seem bigger than they really are when I start looking back at them through hindsight. The same thing is with God. God is a big God. If we focus on him, we'll see him as our priority and all the resources that he can bring to bear in whatever situation we're in. He reminds them about how God has blessed his people before. And again, we see they're standing in God's pre presence, uh, in nine, verse 9 and verse 13. What a great place to stand in the presence of God. And in Christ, don't we stand in the presence of God? What a blessing that is for us. They cry out in confidence that God listens, God answers, God saves, and reminds God that, hey, you wouldn't let the Israelites drive them out earlier in verse 10. But we obviously are very impressed with their humility. We have no power. We do not know what to do. Our eyes are on you. Let's inquire of the Lord. And certainly we have a lot of opportunities ahead of us as a church. And we want you to know, all the, the men up here, I can speak for them as a leadership team, we don't have all the answers. We don't know exactly what to do. But we know the person who has the answers, amen? amen. That's God. We know God and he has, has the answers and our eyes are on him. We want to continue to keep our, our eyes focused on him. And of course, again, we, for the second time, we see the unity uh, mentioned here of the generations of God's people, the, the men, the women, the children, the little ones in verse 13. We'll go to the, the next section here in uh, verse 14. Let's read those verses over. Verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel, son of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jeel, the son of Mattaniah, the a Levite and descendant of Asaph, as he stood in the assembly. He said, Listen, King Jehoshaphat and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, march down against them. They will be climbing, climbing up the pass of Ziz, and you will find them at the end of the gorge in the desert of Jeruel. You will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions, that word again shows up, stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Judah and Jerusalem. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Go out to face them tomorrow with the Lord will be with you and the Lord will be with you. Jehoshaphat bowed down with his face to the ground and all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. Then some Levites from the, the Kohathites and Korathites stood up and praised the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. So what do we again see here in, in these verses? The Spirit came on Jehaziel and he spoke God's word. So God's word is, is available. It's fresh. It's new for them. It says, listen to what the Lord says. Not only that, but don't be afraid or discouraged. And again, that's mentioned in, in verse 17. Again, the battle is not yours, but God's. And certainly as we, we just think about these things here for a minute, uh, it's essential to be in God's word for our spiritual health, for our spiritual growth, for our spiritual maturity. Every study on spiritual growth or health notes that there's a direct connection between our personal time in God's word and our spiritual health, our spiritual growth, our spiritual maturity. So we see that God's word is there. Again, we saw that word stand firm and see the Lord's deliverance in verse 17. And what are they standing firm on? They're standing firm on God's word. They're being obedient to it. 
and they have to face them. They have to face the challenges, the opportunities that are before them. And uh, when they do that, they can move forward when they face those. And Jehoshaphat and all the people fell down in worship. What a great uh, picture that is. And we'll go to verse 20. Verse 20. Early in the morning, they left for the desert of Tekoa, and they set out. Jehoshaphat stood and said, Listen to me, Judah, and the people of Jerusalem. Have faith in the Lord your God, and you will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed them to sing to the Lord, to praise him for the splendor of his holiness, as they went out at the head of the army, saying, Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. Let's just say that together. Give thanks to the Lord, for his love endures forever. As they began to sing and praise, the Lord set ambushes against the men of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The Ammonites and Moabites rose up, or some translations say stood up. Again, there's that word stood or stand against the men from Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them. And they finished slaughtering the men from Seir. They helped to destroy one another. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked toward the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. So Jehoshaphat and his men went to carry off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing, and also articles of value more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled in the valley of Berakah where they praise the Lord. This is why it is called the very Valley of Berakah to this day. Berakah means praise. You probably have a little footnote there. Verse 21, Then, led by Jehoshaphat, all the men of Judah and Jerusalem returned joyfully to Jerusalem, for the Lord had given them cause to rejoice over their enemies. They entered Jerusalem and went to the temple of the Lord with harps and lyres and trumpets. The fear of the Lord came on all the surrounding kingdoms when they heard how the Lord had fought against the enemies of Israel, and the kingdom of Jehoshaphat was at peace, for his God had given him rest on every side. So we see the, the Lord's great victory here. They, they start out early. I was reminded as I was uh, thinking about that, just how Jesus got up early in the morning to go out and pray and how that really is a great way to start your day in prayer. They were listening. We see a great opportunity there. They have, they're encouraged to have faith in the Lord and also have faith in his prophets. So they're, they're supposed to have faith in God, but they're also have, supposed to have faith in God's word and also faith in those who speak God's word. And you will be successful, we see in verse 20. They consult with the people, and that's a big part of our process that we're going to uh, outline uh, this morning, is consulting with you. We value your input. We're asking you to engage in this process with us so that we can know what God's will is as we continue to move forward in various ways. They sing, they praise, they give thanks, and we again, we see that in... Uh, Again, in verse 26, and then we also see the enemies destroy, or they stood up against each, each other. Again, that's significant in this particular section. And there's much joy and re rejoicing. So it's, it's interesting that uh, those brothers and sisters in the Old Testament here, the children, they're, they're showing praise, they're showing gratitude, they're worshiping God, and it's so important, that's why you're here today, right? It's so important to worship God on a weekly basis. But just as important, it's essential for us to be worshiping God on a daily basis. We can worship God every day. And this whole victory really reminds us of Gideon's victory that uh, was won as well. But as we see the, the conclusion of this, uh, verses 29 and 30, I've already read those verses, but when we have our eyes on God, we see how capable he is. We recognize that we are in a spiritual battle, 
and how essential unity is in that spiritual battle. We developed those habits that we've talked about, prayer, Bible reading, reflection, praise, gratitude, worship, and we experience this great victory that God wants for us. And that's what we see here. God radically reversed their situation, led to the surrounding kingdoms, fearing God, and also peace and rest for Judah instead of the devastation that they were facing. We're going to go ahead and uh, listen to uh, some things that Bob has to share with us at this time. Scott. Uh, good morning. Uh, real quickly, First Peter uh, chapter one verse twenty-two. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again not of corruptible seed but incorruptible, through the Word of God which lives and abides forever, because all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man is the flower of the grass. The grass withers and its flowers fall away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. Now this is the word which by the gospel was preached to you. I have heard it said the most constant thing in the world is change. As I continue to age, that seems to be very true, and every year at this time, Jerry Covington reminds me for a few weeks that he's younger than I am, but that's over now. Of course, uh, things... Uh, as we look back through history, things are much different today than they were 50, 100, 500 years ago. And every day things seem to be changing even more. The Bible is clear in Hebrews 13, 8. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, yes, and forever. I really appreciated Devin LeBay's message last week uh, to our seniors. And the main reason this year's men's retreat focused on Jesus was because of all the uncertainty in the world. As most of us know, Scott Laird is planning to transition from a full-time member of our staff at the end of 2023. It is our hope to begin looking for someone later this year who might fill in the gaps Scott will leave, but the pool of ministers is not particularly abundant. In fact, after COVID, the search for ministers has grown, has grown much more difficult. We also want to continue our intern program in the not too distant future, but that will also depend on available candidates. We now have both Zach Schenk and Hannah Burleson as counselors working with the church, plus we have others leading divorce care and Journey to Heal. All three of these ministries seem to be meeting important needs. In addition, we are getting older, and some of us a lot, more, a lot older than we'd like to admit. We also have a number of people who have dealt with or are currently dealing with serious illness. I'm not sure if I've shared this publicly before, I, but days after COVID began, someone called me to say that COVID would take the lives of at least 30% of our elderly. All I can say is hallelujah, that has not been the case, but it has had an impact on many. We all know someone who did lose a loved one during this difficult time. As many of you know, I personally, last fall, lost a 43-year-old nephew with a wife and five sons under the age of 18. None of us knows what tomorrow holds, except God, and we believe he wants us to grab the future and make a difference in as many lives as possible. Fortunately, God continues to send great people to us, and we have some very capable people among us already. As always, we tend to be somewhat transient, but this has allowed us to send over 800 people to other places, and hopefully that will continue. But in order for us to serve God effectively into the future, it is critical we realize how all of these changes constantly affect us and will continue to do so. That's life in these United States and in the Great Falls Church of Christ. We need more people to step up as elders and deacons and others, men and women, to help support those who are already teaching or serving in numerous other ways. Although we've discussed some ideas, the only thing that seems to be said in concrete at this point is Scott Laird's transition in December of next year. There's a possibility he might still remain a part of the staff but all of that depends upon our ability to replace him, the goals we determine, and very importantly, your continued support. Matt's specific roles are also being worked out as we seek a healthy balance for current and future staff. There's also the subject of what we should do with the land at the end of Central. We have had some interest showed in purchasing it, 
but that is a congregational decision we have yet to discuss. Should we start one of the new ministries that Devin mentioned last week in class? Several have asked already, which means we have those who are wanting to do more, but how much more? It takes more people stepping up to serve or hiring new staff. The opportunities are probably limitless, but time and finances are not. As you can hopefully tell by my remarks, we're not insure, entirely sure where we're headed. That's why we're doing what we are this morning, to ask your help and most importantly to seek God's direction. We have been blessed for many years by God's intervention in many ways. God has consistently sent us people at just the right time to help us maintain our purpose and even to grow at times. COVID has been interesting numerically, but like almost every church in the U.S., our attendance is not quite what it was. The congregation was especially blessed for almost 50 years by the leadership and wisdom of Gordon and Betty Naylor. Their examples of unity and service has, have provided us all with a great foundation. My responsibility this morning is to ask all of you to join us in asking God to help us all make the right decisions in meeting these constant changes. Matt's going to share next how we would like to approach this. We in leadership all believe there is much we can still accomplish for God in the days ahead, but we will only be successful if we diligently seek his direction. Proverbs 16, 9, we all know. In their hearts, humans plan their course, but the Lord establishes their steps. Thank you. you have your Bibles, I'd like you to open up to Ephesians chapter 5, please. <coughs> Ephesians chapter 5. On the screen here is a picture, and I selected this because of its ambiguity. Or ambiguity. Um, this is a picture of our, our great city, Great Falls, looking over the Missouri River back toward the city. And it's hard to tell whether the sun is rising or set. Well, I guess if we know the direction, that answers that question. You can tell I'm not directionally uh, gifted, I guess. Well, I, I guess that illustration's out. Uh, but pretend that you don't know which way you're looking. And it's really hard to tell which is going on. Is the sun rising or is the sun setting? There are situations in life that uh, we have to get our bearings and uh, we have to get oriented to be able to make sense of what God is doing around us and what God is inviting us to do with Him around us. And that's exactly what Ephesians 5 talks about. And this text really builds on what Scott Lucas and shared earlier uh, from 2 Chronicles chapter 20. But beginning in the second part of verse 8, Paul says this, "...walk as children of light." Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Skipping down to verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. Times like this, when we're not entirely sure what God is doing or not doing, inviting or not inviting, require us to pause and ponder in prayer and discernment uh, to try to recognize what God is doing and how He is inviting us to join Him in that. As Bob has outlined the challenges, as Scott Lucasen has laid out the foundation in 2 Chronicles 20, what we're inviting you to join us in is a hundred days of prayer and share triplets. A hundred days of prayer and share triplets. The hundred days of prayer and share triplets is three people getting together for a period of time, at least a hundred days. And it's a discernment process that is rooted in the relationship. The relationship between these three and this triplet, but also the relationship these three have with God. And we believe that through that relationship that we have with one another and with God, God can reveal some things to us that enable us to discern whether the sun is rising or setting and what we need to be doing in response to that reality.
Proverbs chapters 11, 14, 15, 22, 24, 6. It echoes that one that Bob read from Proverbs 16 earlier and saying that in a multitude of counselors there is wisdom. We believe that every one of you who are baptized into Christ have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. God's Spirit lives in you and you live in God's Spirit. And because of that, the Spirit that leads us into all truth by bringing into remembrance what Jesus said, you have that Spirit. And we believe that if we can get prayerful, the counsel that God will give through His people will be wiser than the counsel that we can get individually. The 100 Days of Prayer and Share triplets looks like this. Triplets meet 8 to 10 times over a period of about 100 days for approximately 100 minutes uh, between June 14th and September 22nd. 100 days of prayer in triplets meeting 8 to 10 days. We're going to be tapping some shoulders in the very near future to ask people if they might be willing to lead one of these triplets. And each triplet will get a prayer guide. We're in the process of working on that. First draft has been finalized. We're editing, hopefully. Uh, hopefully. Um, but we're editing and we'll have a prayer guide that will guide this discernment process by rooting it in Scripture at every single step. So, the triplets, these groups of three, they spend their time sharing their personal hopes, hurts, and dreams, and sharing their affirmations, challenges, and vision for the congregation. In other words, when you get together for an hour and a half in your triplet, it's not just to do a Bible study. In fact, this is not Bible study. Bible study is the foundation, but this is a time of sharing life together that leads into a time of praying together. Praying together specifically about some things that we've outlined in our, our prayer guide. These conversations that we have in these areas, they then lead to prayer. And so everything that comes up in that conversation, turn it toward God in prayer and see what God has to say and what God has to do with the situations we're concerned with. What do we hope will happen from all of this? Uh, I'd invite you to just flip a few pages to Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Paul is writing to a congregation in Philippi that's got some great opportunities for mission. The gospel can go a lot further than it's already gone in Philippi. And as Paul writes to this church, he begins by calling them to be discerning. Philippians 1, verses 9 through 11. Paul says, It is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. I want you to notice in that passage where the discernment comes from. The discernment comes first of all from love abounding more and more. That's why we're not asking you to pray individually but in triplets. We want to put us in situations where our love can abound more and more. Why? Because when love abounds more and more with knowledge, discernment begins to to come. When discernment comes, then we can be pure and blameless. We, We can approve what is excellent. We can approve what is excellent. In other words, we can make the best use of the time as Ephesians 5 talked about earlier. And so I understand you may have questions about these prayer and share triplets, what this is going to look like and how it's going to work. And we're going to have information coming to you in the next few weeks about this so that we can get them kicked off the week of June 12th. Um, That's the Sunday, but that week anyway. So if you don't have all the answers that you need right now, just hang in there with us. We'll be bringing you more information. But this 100 days of prayer and share triplets is our way of trying to lead you the very same way that Jehoshaphat led Israel. Jehoshaphat didn't give Israel the answer to the problems because the problems were bigger than Jehoshaphat. All Jehoshaphat did was led the people in pointing them to God in prayer. And that's what we're hoping to do through this process too. Scott Laird's going to come up and say a bit more of where this 100 days is going to lead. (laughs) I can still see over the top of it. (laughs) It is good to be together, and it's good to worship God, and it's good to laugh. 
Uh, that's always a healthy part of any congregation is laughter. Uh, just a couple of things for me to share, and I, I start out with what Jehoshaphat confessed in chapter 20 and verse 12. We do not know what to do, but our eyes on, are on you, speaking to God. It's really interesting that after he makes that confession, that's when the spirit of the Lord comes on the prophet. It comes confession first, and then God gives <coughs> revelation. The wisdom of God in Proverbs reminds us, where there is no guidance, a people falls, but in an abundance of counselors, there is safety. Proverbs 11, verse 14. Or plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. Proverbs 15, in verse 22. To seek guidance and counsel, we've invited Grady King to join us on the weekend of December 23rd through the 25th to facilitate our process of discernment through the 100 days of prayer. A specific schedule will be worked out in early September, but time will be provided for the congregation, for all of us, to share what God has been up to in our lives and how that might impact future ministry in Great Falls. Grady is a resource person throughout our brotherhood when it comes to congregational health, direction, and matching ministers to churches. Grady has over 40 years of ministry experience in the Churches of Christ. His ministry passion is summed up in a basic conviction, healthy leaders, healthy churches. He has served in a leadership role with Hope Network since 2012, and that's within our fellowship. In 2016, he expanded his role to include serving as director of church resources at Oklahoma Christian to supplement his years in ministry. Grady has completed a Bachelor of Science in Education, a Master of Science in Ministry, and a Doctor of Ministry. He and his wife Karen live in Irving, Texas. Members of the Mansfield Church of Christ, they have two grown children and two grandchildren. So my request is, please participate in the 100 days, not 100 years, 100 days of prayer and plan on participating in the practice of discernment on the weekend of September 23rd through the 25th. And may God bless us as we seek him. And so I'm going to turn it over to Jerry. Bob, I hate to tell you this, but they knew you were older, they could tell by looking. <laughs> I'm supposed to be speak about us moving forward together. And I thank God for the unity He has blessed this body with through the years and continue to pray that He continues to do so. We have tried to lay out some vision and direction for the church to pray about and work towards while keeping our focus on our Lord and Savior. I would like to point out that the mission could change according to the needs of the church and bringing souls to Christ. As we move forward together, I'd like to read from Romans 12, 3 through 8. For by the grace given to me, I say, every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, through many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophecy, then prophecy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraged, give encouragement. If it is to give, then give generously. If it is to lead, do so diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. As Paul points out, we are many, many members of one body. Each one of us have been blessed with different gifts. It is my belief if we stay focused on Christ and work together as we move forward, we as a church can add many souls to the kingdom of God. Thank you.
We're going to have our invitation song. And if there's anything at all that the church can do for you, whether it be pray with you or put, help you put Christ on in baptism, we'd ask that you come forward at this time. Please be standing. In heavenly armor we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. No weapon that's fashioned against us will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. When your enemy presses in hard, do not fear. The battle belongs to the Lord. My friend, your redemption is near. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory, honor, power and strength to the Lord. Please be seated. We have this opportunity to break bread together, and so my helpers, come on up. All from the same row. Awesome. I'm asking you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 1, please. It is so good to remember Jesus, what he has done, and because of what he's done, how our lives have been changed. And as we come to the book of Revelation, it was a dark time in the church, a time of confusion, a time of question. The seven churches are located in what we would call modern-day Turkey. There was persecution. The world was spilling into the church. There were martyrs. And they were being oppressed by the governing authorities. And yet, this is what John, by inspiration, writes in Revelation 1, verse 4, as a reminder of who we serve. John, to the seven churches in the province of Asia, grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father, to him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. But the church that's wrestling in the first century and a church that wrestles in the 21st century, we serve one who is a faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth and whose blood has freed us from our sins. And because all that is true, he's made us to be priests, to be a kingdom of priests, to serve our God. Not because we're good enough, but because he is king of kings and lord of lords. And with those thoughts, we'll start by breaking bread this morning. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you, we ask, Father, that you help us to be mindful 
of the sacrifice that you made on our behalf. That you sent your son to this earth to live that perfect life, to be that bread for us. As we partake of this bread, help us to remember how he was beaten and scourged, how he was abused, Father, and make that for your glory. Help us to take this in a mindset that reminds us that you were, are, and always will be in charge. Help us to be the people that you've called us to be, Father. Help us to give thanks each day and to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's continue in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, again, we approach your throne and we're so grateful for Christ. We thank you so much for his willingness to uh, give his life for each and every one of us, dear Lord. As we prepare to partake of this fruit of the vine, which is a representation of his blood, we ask that you'd help us to never forget uh, how much he loves us and how much you want to have a relationship with us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
It's extremely appropriate that after we have just reflected upon what God has done, what our response, or at least what part of our response, should be to that. Paul writes a principle. He's talking about the preaching of the gospel, but there's a principle in 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 2. It says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Same principle shows up in Jesus' teaching. What's gone on is, it's been the parable of a, oh, a bad steward. And so Jesus concludes in Luke 16 and says, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So, if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? And if you've not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? And he's reflecting upon our use of finances in this world. If we've been faithful in that, then true riches are also ours. And so the finances we have are really important because it demonstrates our heart. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. But I would like us to reflect on what God has blessed us with and are we being faithful with all the trusts, including our finances, that God has given to us? And may we do this with a cheerful heart. Brandon, would you do some prayer, please? Let's pray. Dear I just most heavenly Father, we want to come before you now, and we just want to say thank you. And we ask that you will use this as, a, as meaningful to your kingdom, that, you can, that we can continue your work here and let us use this as a in your mind that we can use it to help with others in Christ your name we pray amen We'll have one final song before we're led in prayer. Sweetly, Lord, we have heard thee calling, come, follow me. And we see where the footprints falling lead us to thee. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. Though they lead o'er the cold, dark mountain, seeking his sheep, or along by Siloam. Fountains helping the weak. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus where they go. If they lead through the temple, holy preaching. that make the pathway glow. We will follow the 
footsteps of Jesus where'er they go. By and by through the shining portals turning our feet, we shall walk with the glad immortals heaven's golden street. Footprints of Jesus that make the pathway glow. We will follow the steps of Jesus wherever they go. We do have some uh, prayer requests that have come in this morning. Obviously, uh, Rachel Clannon. And then uh, we, the waters are asking for prayers for Matthew as he starts uh, testosterone treatments tomorrow. And the possible side effects uh, could be negative. Also, uh, keep Lana Fallett's niece's family, uh, her boyfriend's family. Uh, he, the boyfriend, had an accident with a saw at work and uh, he ended up uh, dying from that particular accident. He's in his 20s. And uh, so let's keep them in our prayers as well. And uh, we just want to remind everybody, and I'll pray here in just a, a minute, to uh, please join us in the fellowship hall for the McMaster family sending uh, during our class time. Please sign their uh, sending book. And w all of us, uh, the, the elders and uh, evangelists, will be over there in the fellowship hall. So come and visit with us. If you have any questions for us or Scott or Matt, uh, we'll be in the fellowship hall, and we are eager to listen. So again, there'll be no Bible class today from the teen class on up. So come on in to the sending, and if you want to visit with us, we would love that. So let's go ahead and, and pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, our eyes are on you. Lead us, guide us, give us what we need. Protect us, especially our unity. Well, we praise you for your love, your grace, your mercy, your kindness, for the victory that you give us now and will give us in the future as well. Well, we lift up uh, Rachel Clannon, pray for healing for her, pray for a special measure of wisdom, guidance, and direction for her medical staff and, and good uh, resolution for Rachel. Also, we want to pray for Matthew, that his uh, new treatments will go well and that uh, any negative side effects would be minimized. And Father, we pray for uh, Lana's niece's boyfriend's family. Father, what a, a horrible uh, situation for a young man to lose his life. And uh, Father, we just uh, pray for that family. We pray that uh, you would... Uh, be at work in their lives, Father. Give them comfort. Help them to seek you during these difficult days. Father, we love you. We thank you for Jesus. And we pray all these things in his all-powerful name. Amen. And with that, we'll uh, conclude our services. Please join us over in the fellowship hall. And we'll look forward to seeing you over there for the, the sending for the McMaster family. Oh.